So let's talk now about Augustine. We're going to wrap up our, our study of him with, with this session. And in book three about the freedom of the will, each book is set up so it deals with a, a particular set of problems. This one is really dealing with this question, is divine foreknowledge compatible with, with free will? But you notice, you know, as usual, Augustine has a couple digressions. He, you know, goes off and he talks for a while about suicide and whether um, somebody really wants to, to not exist or not. Does that make sense? Um, and you might say, well, that, that's kind of just a, like I said, digression. He's, he's going away from the main argument. Um, it has something to do with it, but it takes some, some time to spell that out. I'm going to try to skip over the digressions as much as possible, and if we have time, then I'll, I'll hit on them in the end. There's also a lot of God talk in there, and, and sort of religious God talk as opposed to philosophical God talk, um, where Augustine is talking about, you know, want, you know, wanting to praise God, or, you know, he starts to get a bit more preachy in this one, doesn't he, than in the other books. And I think that, you know, if you are religious, and your religious uh, views more or less coincide with Augustine, then you'll find those kind of edifying and useful. But I think when you're reading through this from a philosophical perspective, you don't actually have to pay close attention to that stuff. It's better just to pay close attention to um, the arguments, the arguments that are being, being put forward. Because they're by themselves, you know, they're, they're difficult enough, and they're dealing with some pretty deep metaphysical topics. Um, topics in what we call metaphysics, philosophy of human nature, even some epistemology and, and, and ethics. So um, let's talk about this, this question of divine foreknowledge. Um, and let's just think about this concept a bit before we start going into the text. So foreknowledge, that means, you know, there's two parts of this, knowing, and what is it to have knowledge of something? When you say you know something, you can count on it, right? So that's the difference between, say, knowing something experiential, like uh, if you, I'm going to ask you something that you don't know from experience, but you can figure out. Let's say I give this piece of chalk to you, and you don't, you don't chew it or anything, you just swallow it. Would that be a good thing for you or a bad thing for you? Yeah, you didn't have to think an awful lot about that, right? How many of you would say you're confident that you know it would be a bad thing for you to swallow this piece of chalk? Is anybody uncertain about it and wavering? Mm, maybe I should try it. You know, no, you 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 know it. How do you know that? What's the basis for your knowledge? Is it because you swallowed other similar objects and it didn't turn out well for you? Probably not. I hope. Yeah. It's not a food. Okay, there, there's there's an important consideration. It's not a food. You know, we can swallow other things. Like kids swallow pennies and, and they don't kill them, right? Yeah. So you look me at it. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty inert substance. There's nothing in this that's actually going to hurt you. It's probably the shape, right? Yeah. Probably choke. It could cause you to choke. Um, this is hard stuff. Your stomach acid will dissolve it pretty quick, but it's going to hurt quite a bit on the way down. And so it's not good for you, right? So you carried out a very uh, rudimentary process of, of figuring out what's good for you, what's bad for you. That, that ties in with what Augustine calls prudence. Um, at a, at a kind of a low level. And you do this all the time, right? When you're crossing nine. Where do you cross? Wherever you like? Does anybody just run across the street randomly? Why not? Because those cars out there, the speed limit's 40, but how, far, how fast are those cars going a lot of the time? 60. 60, yeah. And if you get hit, now again, you don't know this by experience. You've never been hit by a car going 60 miles an hour, have you? I hope, I hope not. be alive. Yeah, well, you might, but you, you probably wouldn't be, you know, running around. Um, but you know, all of you would say you know that if you step out into 9W and just sort of leisurely walk across, you're probably going to get tagged by somebody, and it's going to be very bad for you to do that, right? You, you don't need to put that to the test. You have knowledge about that. You have knowledge about a lot of different things. And... Um, some of it has to do with consequences, some of it has to do with, um, you know, fairly more abstract things like mathematics. I mean, how many of you know what um, 3 plus 6 is? All of you, right? I hope. Uh, anybody in doubt about that? you got to count it up. I'm 
not sure about this time. No, you, you know. So we know we have a pretty good idea of what knowledge is. Um, do you know anything about your own behavior or other people's behavior? For certain. Is there anything that you can say, I know this for certain? What about with a high degree of probability? Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you cost someone pain, they're not going to be happy. If you what? Cost someone pain, they're not going to be that's happy. A, that's a good, unless they're a masochist, in which case they, you know, they might be like you know, enticing you to, right? But, but if, you're right. In most cases, there's a high degree of probability. Make somebody experience pain, they will also experience unhappiness. And probably be angry to it, right? Um, if, they, if they know it's you doing it. Um, okay, that's that's very good. We we can predict things about things that haven't yet happened. Um, yeah. Does that mean they haven't yet happened to us? Because like maybe because about like, a car going sixty, I mean, we might know that it might be bad for us. But we don't know like, the actual consequences unless we hear a story on the news. Maybe. Yeah, I think you know. <clears throat> When we're adults, we, we have a much better handle on this than kids do. Sometimes kids will do things just to see what happens, right? And you look at it and you're like, man, that was a dumb thing to do. You could have figured that out. Like when I was a kid, I was four years old, I, uh, I took my mom's car keys, and they weren't these kind of keys, they were more like, like, like this kind, and you know, a little bit thinner, and I stuck it into the electrical socket. And I, I thought I was playing start the car, you know? Um, and you can figure out what, what happened. It was 110 volts, knocked me backwards, started melting the key. Um, there were all sorts of other things. My mom was worried and angry. Um, you know, I never did that again. Sometimes you have to you have to acquire knowledge in, in experiential, painful ways. Sometimes you can watch other people do something stupid and say, "Wow, I'm not doing that." That's you know, don't stick your tongue on the the cold. Um, uh, playground post. All of you seen somebody do that, right? When you were at a grade school, you didn't do it, right? You weren't the kid who did it. You know not to do it. You actually understand also how it works. Why does your tongue stick? Well, because it's cold, and you know water freezes, and then you're going to get yourself stuck, and then somebody's got to come along with hot water and pour it on there. You have knowledge of what's going to happen about future events. Um, Foreknowledge is knowledge of what is to come. Now, your foreknowledge is pretty limited, isn't it? And so is mine. For example, you know, you guys are taking the midterm on uh, Thursday. I can I can sort of guess how people are going to do, but my guesses could be way way off. You know, even you can't fully predict exactly how you're going to do, can you? You have some basic ideas. If you, how are you going to do if you don't study at all? and you go out uh, with, with your friends the night before. We have an 8 o'clock class, so let's say you go out. What's, what's bar time here? 2? Two, 2.30? 4. Is it 4? Yeah. Are you serious? Okay. You stay out till 4 in the morning. Um, now all of you are underage, so you're just drinking Cokes the entire time. Um, but you stay out till 4 in the morning the, the, the night before. How are you going to do on the test? <coughs> Perfect. That's that's the strategy. Huh? I mean, you you know, don't you? If you do something like that, you're probably going to do poorly. Um, how much studying do you think? You let me ask you this: How much? How many hours of studying do you think, if you want to do really well on the test, you, you would probably need to put in? Fifteen. Fifteen. Was it like 10, 15? ten to fifteen? Ten to fifteen. Any ten. other answers? Or does this sound reasonable to you guys? Okay, so you, you actually can predict to some degree how you're going to do. But you could get to the test and it could be like a bad day for you and your brain just freezes up. I think we've all had that happen, right? Uh, on the other hand, you could, you know, like stay out till 4 in the morning and, it, you know, some sort of miracle could take place and the knowledge just like pops into your head and you're like, you know, writing like crazy and it, 100%. You don't have, you know, complete foreknowledge about that. And the further and further we get out, the more murky it gets, right? What about for God? When we say God is omniscient, presumably everything is just as totally clear for God as you know, what we consider knowledge that we can, we can be absolutely confident about, like experiential knowledge or mathematics or things like that. 
So God knows exactly, you know, when I when I drop this pen, and I'm not even sure, you know, when I'm going to drop the pen. And I didn't even think about this until a minute ago. He knows exactly where and how it's going to fall. Um, now all the mathematical problems that we can't solve, he knows the answers to those. What the path of my life is going to be, and all the stuff that I don't even remember about my you know, life, uh, going all the way back to childhood, he knows all of that. And he knows all of that um, long before I even exist. So I, I was born in 1970. Um, God knew in 1969 the entire timeline for, for Gregory Sadler. And when he became Dr. Gregory Sadler, and, and when he, um, you know, did something stupid that got him killed, or when he died happily of old age in his bed, you know, he knows all those sorts of things. Um, he knows who I went on a date with on, on this this date, you know, in, in uh, 1989. He knows what I wrote down as an answer on a test in you know 1992. And he knew it before it actually took place. He knew it actually before the world existed. That's what it would mean to have divine foreknowledge. Now, if you put it that way, is that compatible with free will? Remember what free will means. It means you are actually uh, not only morally responsible for your decisions, you get to pick them. But if God knows ahead of time what it is that you're going to do, are you really free? That's the problem. Let's look at it this way. So you have God having foreknowledge. Foreknowledge tells you you will do X at time A. You couldn't do otherwise then, right? I mean, when, when you go wrong with your plan, you can say, well, there were some factors I didn't know about. You know, my foreknowledge, whatever counts as foreknowledge for me, doesn't really make things happen the way they do. Um, but God, he's in a different boat, isn't he? He knows everything. So if he knows something's going to happen, it has to happen, right? It has to happen that way. Then where's your free will? Yeah. What if instead of it's known what one thing has to be done, he can see all the possible opportunities and all the possible outcomes for... Okay, so that's, that's a, a good way to think about it. So God has more knowledge. You have a choice. Um, and you could go this way, or you could go this way, or you could go this way. And here's choice one, choice two, <clears throat> choice three. And they lead to different consequences, right? You know, um, it'll be a different kind of universe, at least in, in the little part that you're in, depending on whether you um, choose to study philosophy, choose to study business, choose to study medicine, you know, all those sorts of things. The trouble is, God already knows which choice you made from foreknowledge, right? Because it's foreknowledge. So yeah, you had different choices at this point, but in a certain way, you never really had any choice. You were you were gonna go this way because God already knew you were gonna go that way. Did you have your hand up, or were you stretching? Well, I think like. Isn't it so you choosing though? Even he, even though he knows, like you still chose it, but he just knew what you were gonna choose. That's one of the ways you can go with this. There are answers to this. I, I've been trying to make this, you know, sort of a pressing problem for you, uh, in the way that Evodius is, because Evodius is really puzzled by this. A lot of people are. Um, now is a, a good time to go to the text. So let's see what Augustine and Evodius say. Um, Vodius says, I am troubled exceedingly by the question of how God can have foreknowledge of all future events and how there can be no necessity for us to sin. Notice, he's, he's worried about how can, um, you know, how can it be our fault when we screw up? He's not worried about how can it be our fault when we do the right thing. 
that, that we're perfectly you know, willing to say, yeah, that, that's fine. It's, it's when we screw up, when other people screw up, we want to say, is it their fault? Or is it really God's fault? It's got to be somebody's fault, right? And he says, if anyone can, says an event can happen contrary to God's foreknowledge, he's attempting to destroy the foreknowledge of God. We don't want to get rid of that. So if God foresaw the first man would sin, and this must be granted by anyone who agrees with me that God has foreknowledge of all future events. So a real easy case, just Adam, right? Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, actually, right? Um, are they going to sin or not? Now, you could say, well, God, you know, we did this last best, right? God made them, and he gave them free will, and he said, you know, go do your thing. Don't screw up. I'm not giving you free will so you can be a screw-up. I'm giving it to you so you can do the right thing. But he knew they, they could do the wrong thing. And he actually knew that, you know, choice one could have been to say, I'm not really interested in apples today. Um, no, I'll, I'll pass on that this time. You know, choice two is say, yeah, I'll try that. Uh, Knowledge of good and evil sounds great to me. Uh, maybe, maybe choice three, I don't know what choice, it could have been another thing, like he picks up the, the serpent and starts you know, swinging it around and smacks it against a tree or something like that. You know, he could, he runs, runs away from the situation. Well, God already knows ahead of time, right, when he's created Adam, which way Adam's going to go. So it kind of looks like Adam doesn't really have a choice. He says, um, I, and so this is a vote. I don't say that God should not have created him because he created him good, nor that his sin could in any way be prejudicial to God. No, in creating him, God showed his goodness. Um, but I say this, since God had foreknowledge he would sin, it must have happened by necessity. So this is a key term here, necessity. Um, when we're talking about necessity, we mean it has to be that way. Right? Necessarily, it must be so. The arguments that we saw for God's existence that people were making, those are supposed to be necessary arguments, not just possible or probable arguments, necessary arguments. Um, you could even say this about things in the world. When I stuck that car key into that electrical socket, provided there was actually current, um, what must of necessity occur? I get zapped, right? Um, with, with the pain thing, right? Um, provided my body's actually working the right way, when you put 110 th volts through it, how many of you have been shocked before? <coughs> By more than like, you know, a 9 volt battery because you're testing it on, on your tongue like a dummy too. Um, but when you get shocked, that hurts, right? Burns. Um, and uh, that, that happens of necessity, given certain conditions. If your body's working right, if your nerves are actually connected, and you get zapped, you're going to feel pain. So it looks like God, his foreknowledge somehow necessitates Adam's sin, or any of our, our, our things. So he says, um, how then is the will free when the necessity seems so incapable, or seems so inescapable? And, and he brings up some other views. Some people will say, well, get rid of God then. Take God out of the picture so we can all be free. That would be one, one solution, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, and he says, others, on the other hand, while not daring to deny God's providence governs people's life, prefer to say that providence is weak or unjust or evil. So God, you know, you've got God in the picture, but God screws things up. That would be another way you could go. And he says, this is a real problem, a real philosophical problem. And this is a problem where we're going to go from what looks like a contradiction. Bless you. When you have a contradiction, what's going on? Some things cannot be compatible with each other. So in this case, what is the contradiction? It's between divine foreknowledge and um, free will. They're saying you can't have both of these. You've got to pick one or the other. So either you've got a God who doesn't know everything or you can have free will, you can't have both. That, that would be a contradiction. And we're not going to go directly from a contradiction to problem solved. We're going to end up going from a contradiction to what we would call a paradox, where something looks contradictory, but it really isn't. But it's hard to wrap our heads around. It's hard to fully understand. And then hopefully by the end of that, 
we'll get some sort of satisfactory um, explanation. But it's going to work by steps. This isn't the kind of problem that you can solve by sort of just saying, well, here's the answer, now we're done. You have to kind of think your way through it because these are, these are some real murky issues. So um, Augustine really gives you two ways of approaching this. And these are not the only ways of dealing with this problem. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you're on, on the right track in thinking of one possible response to this is to say, well, you know, God actually created us as free beings. So God knows of necessity what we're going to do as free beings. That's the, the route that Anselm will take. Um, in, a, in a piece that we're not going to read in this class after, after midterm, which you could read. I'll, I'll steer you towards that if you're really interested in this. Um, Augustine is going to do a little bit different um, tax. So the first thing that he does is he tries to get the, 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 the problem clarified. You know, So he's talking with the Bodhis and he says, so in your opinion, everything foreknown by God comes about of necessity and not freely. So the devotee says, yeah. Does that seem reasonable to you guys? Everything that God knows ahead of time must be happening by necessity. What do you think? Yes or no? Is Evodius right in assuming that? What's your gut feeling? You don't have to stick with it. Just, what is it right now? Does that sound plausible to you? Everything God knows ahead of time has to happen. Yeah. But if you, so are we talking like, adding, like say someone is talking to someone else and they choose to insult that person and God knows that the insult is coming yeah. and that is coming out of necessity. Why? Well, I mean, maybe God knows all the things that make up that person and drive them psychologically. So he knows that at point this, that person's finally going to snap and say the, the mean thing that they shouldn't have said. You know? Like, you know, for instance, with me, I, I, I struggle with, with a bad temper. And I, I've uh, made improvements on that over the course of my life. And all that means is basically I can take more stuff before I finally, like, go off, you know, and, which isn't a good thing. And so, you know, God knows when that's going to happen. He knows exactly what sort of things would be the, the stressors put together. Uh, and he knows that because he knows the things that, you know, make me what I, what I am. So wouldn't, wouldn't that be necessity? Yeah. But what about, like, the different gods that people believe in? Okay. And like, if, like, the one, like, say there's a God that one person believes in who knows, like, potentially everything that they're going to do, but then, like, the other people who might believe in, like, a, dif a different God. So if you have a model of a God that doesn't have, say, foreknowledge, a God who gets surprised by stuff, I guess. then that's not an issue, right? And, and there are some biblical passages where. It kind of looks like that. Like, you know, think about the Tower of, of Babel. There's a really interesting verse in there where, okay, these human beings, you all know this, right? The human beings are building, building the Tower of Babel because they're going to reach the heaven. And, and then God says, wow, i got to put a stop to this because if they do this, who knows what these people are going to do. That kind of sounds like God doesn't know what's, what's up, right? He has, he's not able to predict who knows what they're going to do. That's saying he lacks foreknowledge. And there's ways around this. So, you know, he knocks the tower down, scatters everybody. And, you know. Yeah. Um, back to the Adam and Eve thing. Yeah. Are you surprised when, like, you found out also? Yeah, it kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? He's, he's walking around, hey, Adam, where are you? Well, you know, <laughs> presumably. Now, it could be that it's, it's he didn't know where, and he's waiting for Adam to, like, come out and say, hey, I did the wrong thing, or something like that. We don't really know. With a, lot, with a lot of these things in Genesis, there's such elliptical stories, you know, so much is compressed into a single verse. We don't really know. We probably shouldn't read too much into it. And from a philosophical perspective, we're not going to get a lot of mileage out of that anyway. That's more theology. But let's go on with, with what, what, he, what Augustine is doing with Avodia. So he says, pay attention, reflect, and tell me. What will be your will tomorrow to do wrong or right? Now, let me ask you this. Are you going to do the right thing or the wrong thing tomorrow? 
I mean, if you're actually hedging your bets, you say a little bit of both, right? Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to screw something up tomorrow because I live long enough that I've acquired enough self-knowledge. Um, but on the whole, more wrong stuff or more right stuff in the day? Do you know at this point? Probably more wrong. Just we don't know much. Yeah. Well, just, it's like we're young. We don't really know as much as like someone like you. It's probably not the biggest thing. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of people my age who are you know screws too. Uh, you know, so, um, who you know uh, should know way better than than a young person. And a lot of times, young people are actually more on track than than older people. If the older people have bad habits or things like that, you know, you guys are at least fairly unspoiled compared to, to older people. Plausibly. Yeah. When you say like good or bad, um, is it not like perception? Simply because something you see as like being bad, yeah. the long one could be like good. Let's say we put that problem off. Well, let's say we actually we say there are objectively good and bad things, and you just have to decide. Push button A, you're going to be a, a good guy tomorrow. Push button B, you're going to be a bad guy tomorrow. Now you could push button B because you're you know have sort of being humble and you've got a good understanding, and then you actually do a whole bunch of good stuff tomorrow. So you push the wrong button. We're not able to make predictions, accurate predictions, about what we're going to do. People make all sorts of promises they don't keep, right? And oftentimes they intend to keep those promises. They promise good things, but then they, they don't deliver on it. Sometimes they actually promise bad things. Yeah, I'll kill this guy for you. Um, and then they don't deliver on that, which is a good thing. Boxing's point is, we don't actually have foreknowledge of what we're going to do tomorrow. And he says, what about God? Does God know what you're going to do tomorrow? Yeah, because God has foreknowledge. And then he says, if God knows what you will will tomorrow and foresees what all men will will in the future, whether they exist now or will exist, far more does he foresee what he's going to do to the just and the unjust. And you can pick all sorts of other examples. Does God know um, what he plans on doing at the end of time or things like that? Presumably, yes, right? Because God actually knows his own plans. So he says, God foresees clearly what he will do. Now, if you want to say that, and you want to say foreknowledge takes away free will, what are the implications for God himself? God not only knows what you're going to do, God knows what he's going to do. He has foreknowledge of that. Does that mean God doesn't have free will? That God is somehow necessitating God? Well, that's a problem. Yeah, how could he? Augustine doesn't talk about it that way, but you could say, how could he give free will if uh, he doesn't even have free will himself? Then it looks like even God is caught in the chain of necessity. Um, so there's something even higher than God then, necessity. Um, so that should lead us to you know some some suspicions that maybe we're off about this sort of thing. He tries another tack with this, too. It has to do with happiness and, and willing. And he says, um, when you're happy, are you happy because you're, or when you're happy, are you actually willing to be happy? Are you choosing to be happy? Um, and the answer is yes, basically. I mean, you could be happy in part because of your choices, because you do the kinds of things that actually do make you happy. Um, you could also be happy because you've made the right choices and you're happy about doing the right thing. Um, you know, if, you're, if your soul is more or less in alignment, that's going to be the case. So, you know, when you volunteer at the soup kitchen and you help somebody who's homeless, and even if they don't thank you, you think to yourself, man, that was a good thing I did. I'm glad I did that instead of just sitting at home watching TV. Um, you're, you're taking some legitimate, you know, joy in, in something good that you did. And you, you know, you're not like unwilling to be happy, right? You're not saying, oh, I, I shouldn't be happy. And there are some people who don't seem to want to be happy, but they like being miserable, don't they? You know, you all know some people who like complain all the time and they don't seem to have a lot of fun. They like actually, they're, they're given the option to have fun and they like pass it up. Well, because they like being miserable. That's what makes them happy. They're willing that. Uh, Augustine would say. So you can't actually be happy against your will. Um, that's at least one thing. There's a lot of other things that we can be against our will. He says, um, 
you know, you could, you could uh, die against your will, you can be deprived of things against your will, but you can't really be happy against your will. So there's at least some things that you can't be unwilling of them. Okay. Then he says, can you actually will unwillingly? Because now we know that some things we can't do unwillingly. He says, um, nothing is so fully in our power as the will itself. We saw this last time, right? The will is what we call reflexive. It works on itself. If you want to change the direction that you're going in in your life, you can steer the ship in a different direction, so to speak, by changing your, your will. So he says, nothing is so fully in our power as the will itself. It's ready at once and without delay to act as we will. We can truly say we grow old of necessity. Why? Because our bodies are like this. You know, if I could be uh, in the sort of shape that you guys are in, I would. I'm not willing to be, you know, 42 years old, um, overweight, uh, not in, you know, good cardiovascular health, um, have fairly poor sleep habits, you know, these sorts of things. That's, that some of that is a product of my own willing, right? I didn't get this size by never eating too much. Um, and, you know, if you want to avoid that, you should, you know, eat good portions, right? Um, so it does lie within your will. But at this point in time, I'm not willing to be like this. And I'm going to get older. And you're going to get older, too. And someday you're going to be 40 years old. And... Um, you're going to say, man, I wish I was 30. I wish I was 20. It's not in your, your, your choice. It's something that goes against your will. Um, we are ill of necessity. Some of you guys are sick right now. Did you choose to have a sinus infection? No. Uh, as a matter of fact, you could have actually like done everything you could to avoid it, and it could still hit you. Right? And do you choose even what medicine they, they, they decide to give you for it or not give you for it? No, it's, those are against our will. Those are unwilling. Those happen by necessity of other things. Um, we die of necessity and not our own will. And he says, no one would be so mad to venture to say it. We do not will of our own will. We have at least this much. We get to choose a certain amount. So he says, although God foreknows what will will in the future, that doesn't imply that we do not make use of our will. So let's look at this sort of choice juncture now at this point. The way it's been sort of conveyed is God's foreknowledge imposes necessity on everything. But instead, what's going on at this point? You have a choice. use free will at that point. And God sees you doing that. God's foreknowledge is not making you turn your will this way or that way. God's seeing what you do, but you are he's seeing you do it willingly, freely, at that point. Why is he actually seeing you doing that? Because you did that at that point. It doesn't make sense to, to talk about you willing unless it's freely. That's what it means to have a will. That's what it means to have a faculty of choice, to be able to decide between things. So he says, um, <clears throat> the foreknowledge of God, which is certain today of your future happiness, does not take away your will to be happy when you are happy. You, you freely want to be happy. So too, if your will in the future is sinful, it will not cease to be your will because God foreknew what was going to happen. So if we're thinking about Adam, we could say, yeah, God, when God created Adam, he like saw everything ahead of time. But he saw Adam at this point in time making the free choice to do the wrong thing because he gave him a free will. And that's what it means to have a will. So um, like he says, our will would not be a, our our will would not be a will if it was not in our power. That's what it means to actually have a will, to have something that can decide between different options. Um, he says, when we will, if the will is absent, we don't will. This is about sort of the very concept of the will. Augustine is saying there's there's kind of a nonsensicality to say. <coughs> that I am completely necessitated. I don't have any free will at all. 
Um, it's kind of interesting. This is a digression from, from Augustine. I'll come back to that in a second. When I was teaching in the prisons, I would every once in a while get to the, this, this area where we talk about are we true, truly free or are we not free? And if, <clears throat> if people aren't free, then the people who did crimes, they, they're not really morally responsible for that, right? Because they didn't choose them freely. They were necessitated, right? So maybe they had a bad upbringing, and you know, a bad neighborhood, and they couldn't have possibly done otherwise. And so therefore, if that's the case, it's, it's mean for us to punish them, isn't it? To punish somebody for something they couldn't help doing? That's sort of like, you know, if you've got somebody who is just not good at taking tests, and you make them take a test, and they do badly on it, and then you punish them for it, you're kind of a jerk, aren't you? Because you're, you're doing something unfair. And so I would have guys who'd point this out. Hey, you know, if this stuff is true, if we're really determined we don't really have free will, man, we shouldn't be here in this prison. And then I would say, and well, actually, I would have other guys in the class who'd say in response, wait a second, if, if, if you don't have free will, that means everybody doesn't have free will. And that means that the people who are punishing you are just as determined, without any choice of their own part, to punish you. And so it's, it's perfectly fine for there to be punishment then. If you take away free will from any group of, of human beings, you, you really have to take it away from everybody. And then you can't complain about anything. Everything becomes totally flattened out. Like you, know, like you were talking about meaning last class, you know, or the possibility of being put to the test, right? Um, that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be possible. So. Um, Let's go on, and because Augustine is actually going to give us another possible way to um, to talk about this. So we, one way we can say is, look, it, what it means to have a will is that you actually do have some degree of freedom. You choose freely, even though God can, can see what you're doing. Another way that you could talk about this is much more of a, an aesthetic argument. Aesthetic meaning having to do with beauty, having to do with the the way things you know ought to be in order for them to be to be to be really good and to be appealing. Um, so he says, what about our our um, our soul, our wills, the kind of beings that we are? You guys remember when we talked about these different degrees of being, and there was bare being, and then. You know, animals and plants were at a certain level, and then we were above them. Augustine had this notion, and the Stoics also had this notion. Um, what happens when we screw up? Are we dropping down lower? Let me actually put this back up there. So, so we have this. We have these degrees of We have just existence itself being sensible, being living, right? being able to, to perceive things. That's where the inner sense stuff is at. And then we have understanding, you know, reason. And because of that, we actually have a free will at that level. And then there's you know, higher level, yeah, which is like, you know, where truth is, itself truth, and uh, the virtues in a certain way, and also God, right? Um, now, as you go from the lower to the higher, things are getting better. That's, it's, it's, it's not just that they have more being, they are better, qualitatively better types of being. And when we think about somebody who is a bad person, um, they are, there's something screwed up in them. Augustine has this notion of evil as not being something uh, that exists of its own right. Evil is a corruption or a, a privation or a going astray of the good, right? So somebody who's a bad person, they are still a person though, aren't they? Um, and insofar as they're a bad person, they're, they're bad. But insofar as they are a person, they are, they are good. So they're good and bad at the same time. You could say the goodness of being a person is you know, part of what's being corrupted. You know, the being is being shot through. Again, I'll use my, myself as an example. So I get angrier um, than I ought to. Um, 
and, and you know, lose my temper in moments when I shouldn't and say stupid things because of it. Um, that's, that's my not living up to my full potential, isn't it? And it has, it has consequences for, for other people, it has consequences for me, and sometimes for physical objects. You know, if I get angry enough, you know, I might throw my phone across the room. Well, I haven't done anything like that for a long time. But I would be a better person did I not have that. And, and it's not just that that's sort of a negative thing. The positive thing for, would be for me to be a patient person, to be a person who didn't lose my temper because I was able to respond positively to frustration, right? Responding negatively to frustration is actually my lacking something that I ought to have. Now, I still remain at this level, don't I? Even if I'm a bad human being, human beings are at this level. They're not just at this level, let alone at this level. Here's the piece of chalk or the cell phone. Here's your dog or cat. Even if you are a serial killer, from Augustine's perspective, you are still, as a human being, ontologically better than your dog or cat. Even though your dog or cat is nice and would never hurt anybody, except for maybe, you know, mice or squirrels, um, you are at a, a higher level. So he says, um, when we look at things and we, we say that they're not as they ought to be, it's because we compare them with yet higher things. We say everything should be like the best. But that's not necessarily the case. He says, um, you know, when we're talking about um, people screwing up, they're blamed in comparison with themselves, with the way they ought to be. So if I'm, if I'm angry or unjust or intemperate, I ought to be those ways. And you're not comparing me, um, you know, against the dog or cat. You're comparing me against the ideal me that I ought to be, what I would be if I didn't screw up. So um, he says, when we're making these sort of comparisons, we're saying that God should have done things differently. And, and he says, God created human beings with so noble a nature that even when stained with sin, they're no way surpassed in dignity by bodily light or by any other created thing. So, um, he actually attributes this to the, to the vice of, of envy, um, to, to say that we, you know, things ought to be different. So, what's the upshot of this? I'm going to have to skip ahead very, very quickly. He says, um, God has not compelled people to sin or screw up because he created them and gave them the power to choose between sinning and not sinning. Um, he gave them this power. That's a goodness. The fact that they misuse it still keeps them at this level of being because we're talking about free will. So your free will did not, you know, make things lower. As a matter of fact, um, you're in a certain way better by having it, and the universe is actually better off with having you in it, even when you screw up. Um, I'll skip much further ahead because he has a digression in there about, about suicide. Um, here we go. Um, it says, God made all natures, not only those which were able to abide in virtue and justice, but also those that were able to screw up. That's us. He created them not so that they would do that, but that they might add beauty to the whole, whether they will to screw up or not. I'm saying screw up rather than sin, to try to put it in a philosophical rather than theological frame, right? If there'd been no souls at the very summit of the whole created order, if there'd been no creatures like this, the universe would not be as good. If it all it had was, you know, bare being, you know, chalk and land forms and things like that, and then living beings, but not actual rational beings, it wouldn't be as good. He says, um, if there had been no souls at the very summit of the whole created order, such that if they chose to sin, they would weaken and shatter the whole. A great element would be lacking in creation. He's not actually talking about human beings there. He's actually talking about angels and devils. Even them, even they had a, a, a purpose in the great whole. And he says, again, if there were no souls whose decision to sin or not to sin would no way alter the order of the whole, an important element would be lacking. So there are rational souls lower than the 
higher souls in their function, but equal in nature. And then he talks about a lot of other you know, possible functions. The basic idea behind this whole argument is that by creating creatures that have free will, and by knowing what he was doing ahead of time in creating them, God was making uh, the best kind of universe that was possible. Even though we screw up all the time. Even though we live out a legacy of all sorts of other people having screwed up. Our screw-ups ourselves are sometimes, you know, they're a product of our free will, but they're also a product of all the pressures that all the other people before us screwing up have, have put upon us. Um, so that's, that's another possible way to try to reconcile divine foreknowledge and, and free will. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but um, that's where we'll leave a lot.